All right, I want to welcome you back to another Gymnast Care presentation. Today we're going to be talking about back pain, the cause of the injuries, and the prevention. So I want to thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. Joshua Eldridge. I am the founder of Gymnast Care. I'm the inventor of the X-Brace, author of the book, The Gymnast Care Book on Injuries. And I want to welcome you to this presentation on how we can figure out better ways of protecting our athletes from back injuries. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. I hope this opens your eyes a little bit to what's going on in gymnastics and what you can do as a coach, parent, or gymnast to protect young athletes from injury. There's not a ton of great research out there on back injury that's coming out. We're getting more and more and more. We're figuring out more information not only from gymnastics research, but also from research as a whole. So I hope this also helps to inspire some of that to look into other ways of protecting our athletes from injury. And hopefully, as time goes on, we'll be able to better protect young gymnasts from injury. So let's go ahead and jump right in. What's causing back pain in our gymnast? Is it hyperextension? Are they doing too many back walkovers? Are they having too much force going through body axial loading as they hit the ground and forces are, are put up and down through their bodies? Is it shearing force? Is it because their bodies are going or those vertebrae are going in two different directions at once and you get a shearing force? Is it other stresses that are going into the body? What about flexion or control? You know what? All of these contribute to back pain. And many times, it's a combination of all of them that is causing the athlete to experience back pain. But let's find out exactly why gymnasts are getting back pain. First thing I want us to do is look at the anatomy. Now, today's presentation is going to be focused mostly on the low back. We have two pictures. I'm going to use my cursor here to point them out. This right here is the lumbar spine. This is the cervical spine. This is a combination of two vertebrae. This is looking at a vertebrae from the top. But there's some spots over here in the cervical spine that I want you to see. Now let's point out some of the most commonly referred to portions of the spine for your, when we talk about low back injuries in gymnasts. Right here in this red box, you can see that it's called the pars. And what we refer to that is a pars interarticularis. The reason why is it's between two of the facet joints. You can see these are actually facets. This would be the facet joint because it's a com combination of two facets coming together. There are four facet joints or facets with each vertebrae. So you can imagine with that many joints, there's going to be a lot of motion to that vertebrae or the potential for a lot of motion in that vertebrae which is really important because as human beings, we want to be able to move around, have lots of motion, do things. And it's an important concept as we get into this, what's going on with back pain. So facet joints are pars and articularis. This is a common area where we see pars fractures or stress fractures in the low back. The other thing that can happen is they can go up into the joint area, the facet joints, or they can be in the, in the pedicle, which is actually, this is a posterior aspect of the vertebrae, the area that connects this to the body, which you can see right here. So this would be more the body area if it was on this. It's a little bit different structure between the lumbar and the cervical vertebrae, but it's the same general concept. But the area that connects those two is the pedicle, and I actually have seen pedicle fractures as well. Spinous process is right here. If you felt your back, the bony part that you feel back there, this would be sticking out, the spinous process. You can see it right here on the cervical spine as well. Transverse process right here, it's, a, it's the wings of the vertebrae. Another important part, you can see it right here, and also you can see it as it sits right here on top of the, of the body of the vertebrae or on the bottom of the vertebrae as they, uh, if there's two vertebrae stacked on top of each other. You can see that here and then the disc in the middle. This is an area of shock absorption and it's an important area. The problem is we see many times in our young athletes that have back injuries, we see 
bulging disc. And we're talking about at 10, 11, 12 years of age, we're seeing multiple levels of bulging disc, which would be considered degenerative disease at such a young age. So we know there's a lot of forces going on in gymnastics. And this is kind of a, a quick overview of what's going on with the anatomy of your lower back. Now here's the deal. Gymnasts doing high force skills with very little control or no control of the lumbar spine is what's causing injury in our young athletes. So they don't have any control. So when they do the hyperextension, the back walkovers, they do the flexion, they do the axial loading, forces are moving through the spine with absolutely no control. It's a very dangerous situation. And what we've done is we've allowed gymnasts to add strength and skills on top of dysfunctional movement. Anytime we have dysfunctional movement without no control over movement, and it's just and it's moving in a way that's counterproductive or counterintuitive to the to the proper motion of the body where strength and protection is found and we add strength and we add increasing skills on top of this there's only one possible result and that's injury so i want you to look at this young athlete right here as she punches the floor she's doing a one and a half punch front a one and a half punch front is one of the hardest skills that level nine, in my opinion, that level nines do. Because it's one of the first times that they're doing a skill, they're coming out of one skill, and you can see on this left hand screen right here, we see our athlete is, her back is extended. So they're coming out of this skill, it's one of the first times where they punch the floor and their back is extended or neutral spine. You can see here, this is just as she does initial contact and then you can see full floor compression right here and what I want you to look at is right here on the athlete she's wearing an elite sports band so it's hard to see the lower back because the elite sports band goes right through here but we can see by this angle and you can see as her her belly kind of pooches out as she hits the floor that she's going from a regular lordotic spine and lordosis is the natural curve in the lower back but as she hits here it's almost like her spine is being forced forward and the amount of pressure being put on her body is extreme this is very this is a very um, dangerous thing that's happening with this athlete because the forces are manipulating her back and she's not controlling herself as she goes through this. So one of the things that we have to look at in our athletes, because we know that things like that are going on in our athletes, we have to tell the difference between serious injury and just tight musculature in our athletes. And so this is kind of what's been put out there. And what I say to you parents and coaches is right up here at top, we see the first thing that's out there is plain radiographs. How many of you are able to order an x-ray for your athletes, right? It's just not practical. So what I've tried to do is take this from where your physician or your chiro or your PT has the first say in what's going on to something where coaches have the first say in what's going on because your athletes are going to come to you as a coach or a parent you need to have a strategy of how to protect your athlete from injury and so this is what we do when gymnasts come to you with back pain the first thing that you have to do is you have to restrict movement immediately in the gym to pain free only so if an athlete comes to you and says, I'm having pain when I do back walkovers, the first thing you do is you say, stop doing back walkovers, not get back on the beam and do 30. I know you're busy. I know you've got 100 kids that you're responsible for right now. But the most important is to protect this one athlete that's there. And many times, these young athletes 
don't know how to come to you and properly express what's going on. And it makes it very difficult. One of the things I try to teach our athletes is, is to go to coaches and give them alternative coach. I'm really having, I'm having back pain when I do back walkovers. I've done six of them so far. It just started on number five, so I've stopped doing that. Do you mind if I go and do handstands right now and work on my tight core while I'm in that position um, instead of doing more back walkovers? So give the coach some type of alternative thing to do. That's what I recommend. But many times athletes don't know how to do this, but it's your responsibility as a coach to protect them and keep them away from, from injury. So they have to restrict their, their, their movement to pain-free only. If pain resolves in less than a week, then we don't have to do anything further. We can then kind of move on to our progression which we're gonna get into in the next slide, but begin review core control progression. And coaches, you have to assess the faulty mechanics that are going on during skills. If it's that they don't have the core control to protect themselves, then we can talk about you know, this core control protocol. Maybe they're coming around and they're not rotating properly. Then what you have to do is you have to build drills to get them to be able to do their skills properly. And then we can start this skill progression. But if they're doing something wrong, don't have them keep doing that same wrong process. They're just going to become injured. Now let's say the pain doesn't resolve within one week. After one week, and some gyms have a, have a 72 hour um, component rather than a one week five days they have 72 hours that's great that's fantastic I have no problem with that whatsoever they have to be referred to the sports MDDC DO for evaluation I don't recommend sending your athletes to their family physician unless they're a sports family physician but if they're just going to see their pediatrician, a lot of times they don't understand what's going on with sports and they won't be able to recommend the right things. The same thing goes for your chiropractor and your osteopath. If they don't know sports, they shouldn't be going there. So MDs, I believe it's the American Academy of Sports Physicians, and then AAP is the other one. Um, DCs have the American Chiropractic Board of Sports Physicians. If, you're, if your DC isn't isn't credentialed through the ACBSP, they shouldn't be working with athletes. athletes, athletes. The DO, Dr. Osteopath, they're gonna be the same through, through some of the MD um, sports councils. So look for that because the sports providers are gonna give higher quality treatment for athletes. Now we look at this. When I do my exams, there's two main tests that I look at, but there's a lot of different things that I look for in my exam. But the first thing that I look at is any ridiculous symptoms or abnormal neuro exam. So any pain that's shooting down the leg of the athlete. Or I look at abnormal, any other abnormal neuro exams. I've picked up uh, parse fractures on just reflexes, where reflexes from one side to the other are abnormal. We're able to immediately get them x-rayed and MRI'd to find out what was going on. The other one is a stork test. The stork test is when our athlete stands on one leg and does extension. And I like to also include rotation in that as well. They'll have pain at the point of their back. It'll be point tenderness and they'll point right to their spine. And usually both sides will elicit this pain. If this test is positive, then I move on. I do my soft tissue techniques. And if it relieves completely, then it's most likely soft tissue based. If there's any pain left, so the pain doesn't resolve 100%, then I automatically move them to x-ray and MRI um, and other exams if needed. Now remember, you're not gonna see PARS fractures on x-rays in the young athletes. I haven't yet in four years of working with gymnasts, seen an x-ray that shows the parse fracture when it initially occurs. Bone has to be severely uh, injured before you're gonna see it on x-ray 
And a lot of times the pars fractures are small with a lot of bony swelling going on or bony edema that accompany it. I personally like MRIs. Some, some other people like to do specs or CT lumbar spine. So, and, and like bone scans are the specs. So just seeing if there's any hot spots. I really like the MRIs because we get a overall view of the rest of the soft tissue in the spine as well. If there's positive findings on the MRI, then they have to start the protocol. The first thing is no gym activity. This is too serious of an injury. No gym activity allowed. They're gonna go three weeks of absolute rest or until pain is gone. PT for pain reduction. And then they're gonna return to play protocol for gymnast, for the gymnastics um, protocol. And they're going to start at phase one and progress. Usually it takes three to six months for them to return fully to gymnastics. Don't rush this timeline. It, it's too serious of an injury to be messing with. And it gives them that time to build up their strength as well. If it's negative results, if nothing's there, it doesn't mean that they don't have a fracture. So many times there's still something there. We just have to be careful with them. So I still say we begin the soft tissue therapy and core control protocol and we restrict gym activity to pain free only. We don't want to push through any pain because then it could cause a fracture if there isn't one there. So the biggest thing with this, we're assessing faulty mechanics and we're returning to skills with progression. So, so let's jump into this. Here's my return to back injury progression for athletes. We're starting down at phase one, pain reduction. They can only return, they can only move up to phase two when they're completely pain-free at rest and without movement. Then we're gonna move them up to control. They're, they have to do these exercises and still be pain-free to move up to form. Form, we're building up the proper movements and then we move them to strength. With phase three, coaches can begin drills once they get at that point. So this usually, depending on how long it takes them to be pain-free, it can take four to eight weeks before they move to control. Control then is gonna take four to eight weeks longer, possibly 12 weeks, and then we're moving into form. Once they're in form, then they can get back in the gym and start doing drills. I don't mind if they go to, in phase two, with control, if they go to gym and they work on these exercises at gym, as long as they're not doing drills or skills while they're in the gym, rather focusing on this. And like I said, it can take four to 12 weeks for them to master this. And then we move up to phase four. We've got the strength. Coaches can then begin a slow progression back to skills. We're looking, like I said, three to six months to get to this point. And this is just the beginning point of phase four. So they're not gonna be, it's gonna take up to a year to build up to some of these goals of phase four. But at the beginning, we can start working back to those skills at, you know, once they progress three to six months. Here's what they look like. And then also we've had our, our PT uh, advisors over at Totem Lake Physical Therapy where I have my office hours they've weighed in and given some of the things that they would do to help out as well as this progression. So during this return to back injury progression, phase one pain reduction, they're only doing one exercise. And this goes along with the PT, the posture training. All we're working on, you can see Breezy, my daughter, doing it right here in this picture. She's doing tight core. So she's tightening her core and learning to breathe at the same time. This is very unstressed position. If it causes pain, we wait until pain is gone before beginning this exercise. Biggest thing is pain free with rest and with movement. Now control is the next progression. The reason why I have a control is because we want our young athletes learning to move their body properly. They have to be able to do the gymnastics tight core. And just for your information, all of these progressions are found in the Gymnast Care book on injuries or in our community. You can find the videos of all of this. 
I know we're just going to walk through these quickly, but there is a place where you can find out more information about this. So, and I'll point to those as we get towards the end, but just so you know, you don't have to know exactly how to do these right now to get this information and understand it. Those resources are there for you. So the gymnastics type courts where they're laid out flat, they look like they're in releve, but laying on their back, toe down landing position. They start up releve with their arms over their head and be, learn to land properly. Cross crawl, which is what Breezy is doing right here. It's a great exercise to teach athletes to use their arms and their legs and keep their hips neutral with a tight core. The squat, such an important exercise for all athletes learning to properly utilize their glutes and hamstrings and quads in proper proportion. Phase three form, the exercises that we're working on, on here is our gymnastics tight core on the ball with extension, landing, so they're using from 18 inches, they're jumping and landing, monster walk full, great exercise. You see it done a lot with your athletes, but most of them aren't doing it right. It's where they sidestep back and forth. So we want to make sure we do that properly. Star air balance test. And what that does is that goes with a lot of the dynamic core stability. So this is a great way where athletes are going to start um, rotational components to their, to their uh, rehab. It's just one exercise. There's many exercises that you can work into dynamic stability. Cross crawl and ball. And then um, teaching our athletes how to do the press deadlift pull up with proper form. And the reason why we talk about these exercises, if you see the article, Should Female Athletes Lift Weights? Make sure you check that out by Bill Sands, Dr. Bill Sands. It is a fantastic article on why gymnasts should be lifting weights. And I'm a big proponent of athletes building strength in the weight room, getting their strength first, then getting skills once they have the strength. And for strength, taking those basic movements with proper form and increasing strength, which is going to help out with their skills. So we're building the strength first. We're not building strength through skills. We're building the strength, then adding the skills, which is proper movement. So here's the deal with this and all back injuries for an athlete. Returning to pre-injury status is not sufficient. So one of the things with insurance policies and, and all of that, when you send your athlete to PT, they do an awesome job of getting them back to their pre-injury state. It's what insurance companies will pay for. But here's the deal. An athlete that has just returned to pre-injury status is going to get injured again. We have to systematically make them better athletes, give them proper movements, and then, as coaches, you need to add proper skill to this. And the second point about this progression in back injury is core control, which is what all that was about, was learning to properly control the body, must match the stresses being placed on the body in the gym. So now, in this Olympics in 2016 coming up, how many of you expect the athletes to be able to do a tuck and roll and stand up and present? Right? That'd be ridiculous. You don't expect a tuck and roll from, from the Olympians. You expect them to do double backs and full ins and full outs and all this crazy, amazing stuff that, that the best in the world should be doing. It's the same thing with core control. I expect my three-year-old or my seven-year-old that are just starting out to be able to do tight core. If all they can do is tight core at level 10, there's a big serious problem about their ability to control themselves. They should be able to control themselves when they're doing double back in any position because they're going to find themselves in many positions during gymnastics, both in intended and unintended. They need to be able to move and protect themselves no matter what position they're in. Second thing is, is I don't expect my seven-year-old to be able to squat her body weight. But as she progresses and as she moves up and builds skills, the first thing I want to do is see her be able to control her body in the weight room and then add those skills on top of that strength that she already has. 
so core control must match the stress being placed on the body. And if you have questions on this, make sure you leave them in the comments below. I'd love to hear your questions and be able to answer them. Like I said, we've got more, res the, more um, resources, and you can find them at the Gymnast Care community, gymnastcare.com forward slash community. We actually have the digital version of our Gymnast Care book on injuries there. So you can see that with the videos that go along with them. The Gymnast Care book on injuries can also be found on Amazon. So thank you so much for joining us for this presentation on back pain. I hope it was you were able to see some of the different perspectives. To recap though, with back pain, it's because gymnasts are moving around without control of their body. Number two, they have to get control of their body. Number three, there has to be a progression to get there. That's what's going on with gymnasts and back injuries. Once again, my name is Dr. Joshua Eldridge. Thank you for joining us for another Gymnast Care presentation. And I'm looking forward to seeing you next here, <laughs> next time right here on gymnastcare.com. Have an awesome day. Thanks for joining us.